Hi everybody, it's Jan again, Pastor Jan here on Sunday for our morning uh, church. So we welcome you, everybody that's watching, to Lord of the Harvest Christian Fellowship. Um, so I'm going to open right now with a prayer. Then we're going to be looking at Psalm 104. So if you want to have your Bible ready. Also, this is going to lead right into communion. So if you want to have something to drink and eat, um, be prepared for that too. All right. So Lord, I just thank you for this day. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this day. This day that you have made, Lord. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, there's so many prayer requests right now in the body of Christ. I just pray for all those, Lord, that have a request, dear Jesus, that you hear them, Lord, and that you have a plan for them and you answer according to your plan. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, we're going to look at Psalm 104 today, which is a, a completely beautiful psalm, completely from beginning to end. And um, oh, I'm having trouble with the dog here. I'm sorry. Okay. So we are looking at Psalm 104. Again, um, it just is one of those psalms you could read over and over and over again and know how great our God really is. So it begins actually with that verse about how great our God is. Okay, you think I'd be ready <coughs> with the right page? Everything but 104. Okay, here we go. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. O oh Lord, my God, you are very great. We could really finish right there and just spend this time talking about this greatness. <coughs> Excuse me. But I think we all um, sometimes forget how great he really is. I just was listening yesterday to a woman and forgot her name, but anyway... She's a big guru uh, in education, and she's also a big supporter of um, inner city kids, and she's done a lot, I think, in Chicago. Um, <coughs> and she says that um, kids need to raise their bar. And when I heard that, and I read the psalm, I thought, we need to raise the bar of our God. We have settled into believing He's in a certain place, he's a certain way, and that's the end of it. And we keep our bar low, it's low. And even if we raise it, it's not raised high enough. God is incredible. And you know, when we look at this, this Psalm, it talks about his creation, all that he did. Actually, it's a poetic version of Genesis. It, it's easier to read and it's in a way a lot more beautiful obviously, because poetry can do that. So when you listen, when you read this, you, you really get a deeper understanding of when God created, it wasn't like one day he went out, woke up and said, light, let there be light and went back. And the next day he got up and he did whatever and he and went back. He had a plan. He knew that light would do this and water would do this. And this animal was designated to be a night prowler. And these animals were made to be day prowlers. And he knew that the trees would supply oxygen. And he knew it all. It was a plan. It was a plan. It just wasn't thrown about haphazardly. And sometimes I think that's why people don't believe in the creation story. Because it, it appears that it's just thrown out there. But there was much thought behind the plan. The, and, and everything works. Everything works so wonderfully together. Now, you know the story of Job. Well, Job, um, you know, he just, he just wasn't getting it. And um, Finally, God said to him, and I, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I would like you to think about reading this later. Chapter 38. This is what God, uh, out of the whirlwind, he says, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? You know, I think that's us many times. We, we come to God without wisdom, without knowledge, and we think we know more than he does. Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Look at the questions he asked. 
Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who determines its measurements? Surely you know or stretch the line upon it. To what were the foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? And when the morning stars sang together, and all the gods, a sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors, and when it burst forth and issued from the womb? And when I made the clouds and garment and thick darkness its swaddling band, and when I fixed my limit for it and set bars and doors, and then I said, This far you may come, but no farther, and here your proud was waves must stop. Now I'm not going to go on, but if you go on, you'll see how God questions Job. And I think many times God needs to question us. We think we have the answers. We think we know it all. But you know, remember in Jeremiah, what he said about um, our knowledge? He says, uh, well, I'll go back to that in a minute, but let's go back to 104. Notice that the very last verse in 103 was, Bless the Lord, O my soul. We're saying it twice, and whenever scripture has something repeated, it's very significant. So I'm crying out, bless the Lord, O my soul. Y you are very great. Now, you know, it's interesting. I was reading an article in this uh, pastor, uh, read an article about somebody did a survey of uh, junior high kids. And they asked them um, something like... Um, this question, um, where's the question I wrote down? It was pretty interesting. Um, it was something like, um, do you, do you think that, uh, God is able to, um, understand physics, understand, um, molecular biology, um, nuclear physics? And they said, the majority of them said no. They didn't think I would understand that. Isn't that amazing? And how many of us, not by thinking it or saying it out loud, but act like that. And what their perception of God was, he was an old man. He was an old man just sitting. He was an old man who could talk to snakes in the garden. That, that's how they perceived him. And if our perception of God is so low, now granted, none of us would say that. None of us would see God as Bernie Sanders. But we need to really question, what do we think of our God? Where is our bar for him? Is it low? Is it high? Is it in the middle? Where is it? Even our highest bar might not be high enough. So let's keep reading here. You are clothed with honor and majesty. You cover yourself with light as with a garment. You stretch out the heavens like a curtain. You know, my notes from, uh, I don't know when I preach this, I have light. Can give heat, energy, dismiss the darkness, can be a guide. Well, he's clothed in all those things. So if you think he's clothed in that, what's under that? You stretch out the heavens like a curtain. Now, it, that's talking about stretching it out like a tent. We'll keep reading. And the tent represents the tabernacle. He laid the beams of his upper chambers in the water. Who makes the clouds his chariot? Who walks on the wings of the wind? Who makes his angels spirits, his ministers a flame of fire? Now, you know what's really interesting? In ancient times... There's all sorts of stories about creation. Every ancient civilization has a story. And there's some that believe that the earth was just water. And then, and then the water began to recede till we had, and it was flat. And then, then eventually there was like a, a rectangle with four pillars and that floated. And then eventually as the waters retreated, we got more land. And so again, man trying to make reason out of what happened. And, and they even explained that there was water above the sky. So we had land, sky, and more water. And when the flood hit, that water is what broke onto the land. So that could be true. But in man's mind, we have to have a solution. We can't just rely on what God says. You have laid the foundations of the earth so that it should not be moved forever. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains. 
At your rebuke, they fled. At the voice of your thunder, they hastened away. They went up the up over the mountains. They went down into the valley. So he controlled water, and he told it what to do. To the place where you found it for them, and you have set a boundary that they may not pass over, that they may not return to cover the earth. He set the springs into the valleys, and they flow among the, the hills, and they give drink to every beast of the fields. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. By them the birds of the heavens have their home. They sing among the branches. He waters the hills from his upper chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your works. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the service of man, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine that makes glad the heart of men. Oil, notice there's wine, oil, water, to make his face shine. And bread, there we go, which strengthens man's hearts. The trees of the Lord are full of sap. The cedars of Lebanon, which he planted, where the birds make their nests. See, there's a plan for everything. We can look out and see a tree in our front yard and say, oh, look, that tree's beautiful. But God created that tree for a reason. The stork has her home in the fir trees, and the high hills are for the wild goats. The cliffs are a refuge for the rock badgers. He appointed the moon for seasons. We talked about seasons in our Wednesday Bible study. There's a season for everything. The sun knows it's going down. You make darkness, and it is night, in which all the beasts of the forest creep about. And the young lions roar after their prey in the darkness. And they seek their food from God. And when the lion rot, the sun rises, they gather together and they lie down in their dens. And man goes out to his work and to his labor until the evening. You see, God appointed a time for everybody. And the animals, certain animals are night creatures. They don't interfere with other animals. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions, this great and wide sea in which are innumerable teeming things, living things both small and great. There the ships sail about. There is that Leviathan which you have made to play there. And again, that Leviathan refers to an evil in the sea. But the, th the point is, is that God created all things and God is not, not subject to evil. Evil is subject to him. And so, you know, it has been pointed out when I read something that maybe he made uh, Leviathan just a toy with them. It, it, God is not afraid of anything. These all wait for you that you may give them their food in due season. And what you give them, they gather in. You open your hand, they are filled with good. You hide your face, they are troubled. And don't we feel like that? I'll hear people say, I don't feel God, I can't see him, I don't know where he is, what's going on? He's there, he's always there. We don't have to feel him to know he never leaves us, scripture says. He never forsakes us. He is always with us no matter where we go. I'm good, I lost my face. You take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He looks on the earth and it trembles, and he touches the hills and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. May my meditation be sweet to him. I will be glad in the Lord. May sinners be consumed from the earth, and the wicked, wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord. Um, we need to really realize that God owns everything. He owns the land. He owns the air. He owns the water. He owns everything. And we can think, you know, oh, we're wealthy. We're not wealthy. God is the wealthy one. And we need to be dependent on him. He is the creator creator of all things. He's the supreme being. We need to always remember that. He's the one that provides the air, the water, all our goods, all our food. He does it. We can't ever think, oh, I'm so cool. I'm so great. 
look at my grass. It's so beautiful. Well, who created grass and who created the water and who, you know, we are nobodies. Um, he created and he planned all those different ecosystems in the world. Now, you know, we need to stop and really look at what God has done. He had a plan. He has a plan for you. He says in um, Jeremiah 29, if I can find it. Jeremiah 29. He has a plan for you. Do we have a plan? Do we believe that God has a plan or had a plan, still has a plan for us? Whatever's going on in our life, do we believe it's part of his plan for us? Great, I can't find it. 29.10. So anyway, let me continue with this. Here. The scripture, um, 29.10. For thus says the Lord. No, I don't want that part. When you call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you, you will seek me and find me. When you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations, all the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place which I have sent you to exile. So whenever, so he says, for I have the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. So sometimes right now we may be feeling that we're in darkness. We're like not seeing God. We're not feeling God. We're not. But look out at his creation. Now, the, what we look out now and look at is not how it was in the beginning. It was perfect in the beginning. And, and sin has corrupted it. It's not as beautiful as once was, but still you can go to places and you're amazed at the beauty of God, of what he did. But I think what I want you to take away today is this. Um, I just want to finish up with the scripture, 1 Corinthians 1, 27. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame to things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of whom you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that as it is risen, written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. So here's the thing. Here's my takeaway. Everything God does, has a, is part of a plan. Everything. His creation story seems very simplistic if you read it in Genesis, but when you read it in Psalm 104, you see a little bit more depth to it. He absolutely thought about cause and effect. And if I did this, this, what would happen? Think about man, man's creation. Very intricate, very thoughtful, planned out. So if God had a plan, where is your thoughts? about your God. If he created all this, and I, I'm sorry, you know what, people that believe in evolution, I'm sorry, I hope I'm not offending you, but I think it's hogwash. I just think that God is so mighty, so wise. He can create all things. It doesn't have to, and where would it evolve from? What, what, I'm sorry, I just don't get that. But anyway, God is the master. He had a plan he has a plan for you. Now, we have so many prayer requests this week for people in our church. And I want them to know right now, God has a plan. This is part of his plan. Don't, don't despair. Know that this is part of his plan for you. So at this time, let's take communion and, and think about how he fulfilled the plan his father had for us. I mean, it was really incredible that he did that. Um, God of the universe, God that created all. So let's lift the bar way higher. Let's say God is able to do all things. And because he's able, he can make me able to. 
So, Lord, we thank you for your plan. We thank you for your plan for us. We thank you for the plan for the whole world. We thank you that, Lord, that you knew your death would bring us life. We thank you, Lord, that you know that every intricate part of your creation has an effect on another part of your creation, Lord, and that we, too, as the body of Christ, interact and have an, an incredible plan of togetherness, of unity, to bring forth the gospel in this hour. Thank you for your body, dear Jesus. Thank you for, for going to that cross and suffering a horrible death. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your blood, Jesus. Your precious, precious blood, Lord. When we drink this, let us always remember who you were, who you are, and who you will always be. Thank you, dear God. Thank you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. So we must raise that bar. Don't look at God like he's little, like he's Bernie Sand. Not that Bernie Sanders is little. You know what I mean. He's not a man. He's our creator, and he can do all things, and he did all things, and he will continue to do all things. Have a blessed day, and go in peace. Well, good morning. We're going to go right into the Word, and... We want to attempt to sum up book four of the Psalms. Uh, book four began with Psalm 90, and it ends with Psalm 106. Uh, our congregation is reading one psalm a day. We are on 104, which Pastor Jan read today. 106 is where we end book four. Book four is the, a very unique book. The Psalms themselves are, are unique. In book four, if we look at Psalm 90, it's the only Psalm in the entire Psalter written by Moses. Psalm 90 is a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Psalm 92 is the only psalm in the entire Psalter, the book of Psalms, that is described as a song for the Sabbath. Psalm 100 is the only psalm entitled, A Song for Giving Thanks. A psalm for giving thanks. Only psalm in the entire Psalter titled that way. Psalm 102 is the only psalm in the Psalter where there's a lengthy description of who this psalm is for without listing who wrote it. A prayer of one who is afflicted when he is faint and pours out his complaint before the Lord. And in the first three books, Psalm 1 through 89, the majority of the Psalms are titled according to the person that wrote them. And all of a sudden, in book four, you have the majority of the Psalms are untitled. And of course, we've said that that goes back to the fact that the first Psalm Psalm 90 is attributed to Moses, and so the majority of the untitled psalms in the fourth book also belong to Moses by inference. Now, we know where Psalm 90 starts. It is a prayer of Moses. And so this Psalm 4 starts with the idea that Moses was an intercessor. When we look at the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and remember there's the parallel, just as those books were the books of Moses, uh, 
the Psalms are the Psalms of David, and that's why the Psalms of David are divided into five books, because we, we, we're looking at the, the Torah and we're looking at the Psalms, and they represent two of the greatest leaders that Israel had, Moses and David. Moses makes his entry here in the fourth book of the Psalms after David has dominated the first two books of the Psalms and then the prophets Asaph and the sons of Korah dominated the third book. Moses dominates the fourth book. Moses makes this entry and what we see is this whole idea of intercessory prayer at the start of book four. Remember that book three ended with the 89th Psalm. The 89th Psalm sings of this covenant that, that God made with David, that God would, would use David and David's descendants to establish God's kingdom on the earth. And the first three books of the Psalms are, are dominated by the, the, the idea of these the kings. Book one of the Psalms is the kingship of David, how God established the kingship of David. As the history of Israel went, then David, in book two, uh, prays for his seed to continue. And, and, and book two is about this story of, of, of the, the time of the uh, reign of Solomon, uh, that David successfully prayed to pass on his legacy, to pass on his mantle, to pass on his kingship to his son. So the first two books of the Psalms deal with this Davidic kingship, David and then Solomon. We get to the third book of the Psalms, and as we know, when Solomon's son Rehoboam became king, then the, 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 the kingship was taken and it was removed from the Davidic leader and split. Ten northern tribes became Israel. Two tribes still uh, were ruled by the sons of David called Judah. And so at the end of the third book, Psalm 89, where the, the kingdom has been divided now, we come and we find out that it's during the divided kingdom that Assyria destroys Israel, Babylon destroys Judah, and the kingship is gone. The, the people of God go into exile. They're under foreign rule. Pastor Jan read from Jeremiah 29. That's Jeremiah prophesying that the kingdom was going to be taken from Judah and the people were going to be removed into exile without a king. So Psalm 89 ends with, Lord, you promised us this Davidic king and now we have no king. And so book four begins with Moses. Moses' prayer, Moses' intercession. And it's, we're reminded of a time before there ever was a kingship. I mean, the, the, the life of Moses and the life of David are separated by 400 years. There's, there was no king among the people of God in the time of Moses except the Lord. And so Psalm 90 becomes the answer to Psalm 89. Where's the kingship? The Lord is king. And the Lord is king begins in Psalm 90 with Moses the intercessor. Moses is the one who prays, and when he prays, God changes his mind. And that takes us back to the time of the Exodus. Now when we look at Moses, Moses is an ideal leader. David is an ideal leader. David is the ideal king, the one who exercises the authority of the kingdom. Moses has many fa facets. Moses is seen as a prophet. Moses is seen as an apostolic leader. An, apost an apostolic leader is one who is sent by God on a mission. When Moses encounters the Lord in the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, the Lord says, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh. I'm going to send you to my people. I'm going to send you to take them away from the slavery of Egypt and bring them into the wilderness and give them their own land. 
So Moses is seen as a prophet, as an apostolic leader. He's seen as a shepherd of God's people, as a, as a pastor. And he's seen as a teacher, one who teaches God's people. But his fifth role is the role of an intercessor. Moses, for all his prophesying, teaching, leading, shepherding, Moses prays for God's people. He prays them through the wilderness. And of course, book four is also the numbers book, which is Israel in the wilderness. So there's this this emphasis in book four that when human authority, human leaders, when the, the kingdom seems to be slipping from the grasp of God's people, God raises up intercessors to pray for God's people. Now, let's, let's look at this because this is a common theme in the Old Testament. Moses is an intercessor. When you go back and just uh, on our way uh, backward, um, let's take a look at, um, well, we're actually not going to move backward in terms of the books, but backwards in terms of some uh, time frame. Um, go to the end of book two, the final uh, psalm in, in book two is Psalm 72. And remember, each one of the five books of the psalms end with a subscription. There's a superscription is the the title of the psalm. A subscription is something at the end of each collection of the psalms. And book two ends with Psalm 72 verse 20. And then we begin book three and Psalm 73. And look how Psalm 72 ends. It's ending the entire second book of the psalms. It ends this way. Psalm 72.20 72.20 reads, the prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. David is an intercessor. Moses is an intercessor. Jeremiah was an intercessor. As Jeremiah prophesied that the exile was coming, Jeremiah, in his book, he continues to pray and pray. He prays for Israel on the verge of the exile. David prays for Israel as he is about to die and pass the kingship on to his son Solomon, another leader. Moses prays throughout the history of Israel in the wilderness, praying Israel through the wilderness and into the land that God promised for them. Daniel, at the end of the exile, prays in Daniel 9. He intercedes for the people to be restored to the land, taken out of the exile and restored to the land. And Isaiah 53, and that's the passage I want to go to. Isaiah 53 is the suffering servant of Isaiah. We know that it's a Messianic prophecy, Isaiah 53, refers to the coming Messiah, the Lord Jesus. Jesus sums everything up from Moses' intercession. You know, Moses was, was standing on the mountain of transfiguration with Elijah the prophet. Moses is there when, when Jesus is transfigured. Moses' intercessory ministry points to the Messiah. David, his son, who even though the kingship is destroyed when Babylon destroys Jerusalem and there are no more kings, nonetheless, David's son, Jesus, Jesus in his human family line is a descendant of David. Jeremiah prophesies of the new covenant that God will make one day with his people when the Messiah comes in chapter 31 of Jeremiah. And Daniel, when he prays in Daniel 9 for the people to be returned to their land after spending those 70 years in Babylon that that Jeremiah prophesied, when Daniel begins to pray and say, Lord, it's been 70 years, 
bring us back into the land. And, and his intercession sets something in motion, just as Moses's and David's and Jeremiah's did before Daniel. It sets something in motion and, and the king of Persia, Cyrus, is raised up and he sends the people of God back to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple. But as Daniel is praying for that event, the angel Gabriel appears to him and says, now, this exile and this return to the land is a, is a picture of a far greater event. God's people were exiled from the land and they were exiled from their home and they were exiled from the temple. But there's, there's a bigger picture here than just going back and to a physical city and a physical land and a physical temple. There's something heavenly about all of this. And that these things that are going on on earth are pointing to a greater reality. And then Gabriel prophesies about the coming Messiah, Jesus, that Jesus will be coming. The Messiah will be coming and he will establish the true temple and the true city of God and the true land of God. The temple being the church, the city of God being the New Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, the land of the inheritance is the fact that God's people will be sent out into all the earth to proclaim the gospel. So the intercessory prayer of the, the greatest intercessors in, in, in Hebrew history ultimately point to the ultimate intercessor, Jesus. Now, Isaiah 53, of course, points to the dimension of the Messiah that he will be a suffering servant. And we know we've been through Isaiah 53 at Lord of the Harvest a number of times. And it speaks of the suffering that Messiah must go through to attain the kingship of the Lord. And I just want to read the last verse of 53. And I'm going to read it from the ESV. Therefore, I will divide him, and this him is speaking of the suffering servant. Therefore, I will divide him, and the I, of course, is God, God the Father, Yahweh speaking, concerning his righteous servant, his suffering servant. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. I'll, I will uh, provide this inheritance to him. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong. He's going to be given an inheritance and he's going to divide that inheritance with others, with his people. The people of the suffering servant, the people of the Messiah. And this is going to happen because he, the suffering servant, poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, numbered with the rebels, is what that word means in Hebrew. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors, for the rebels. Now, this suffering servant, the implication here is that he too is making intercession. But his intercession is that he, be, he himself becomes a living intercession. He himself becomes an intercessory prayer. If you look at the, the, the verse 10, if you back up to a couple verses, it was the will of Yahweh, the Lord, to crush him, the suffering servant. He has put his suffering servant to grief. When his soul is made a sin offering, the very soul of this suffering servant, of this Messiah, is made a sin offering. He, that servant, shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. His death releases his offspring. His death gives birth to his offspring. Out of the anguish of his soul, this servant shall see and be satisfied. By knowledge of him, by knowledge of this servant, shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. And then that brings us back to verse 12. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. Now, it's interesting about this first part of verse 12. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. And back in September, a 
a brother in the body of Christ uh, raised a teaching uh, on this verse to me and asked me, was this an accurate teaching? And some translations, the majority of translations read the way the ESV does. I will divide him a portion with the many. I'm going to give him an inheritance among the many. But there are, there's, a, there's another um, trajectory in, in uh, the translations of the Hebrew at that point where it actually translates it this way. Therefore, I will divide him the many for his portion. Instead of that, that he's going to receive an inheritance and he's going to give it to the many, the many actually become his inheritance. And so I, I, I did some research. I looked at about 14 translations, did a little research in the Hebrew, looked at some commentators, and found out that that verse, the, the, the clarity of the Hebrew language there, could be translated either way that it could be translated, I will divide for this suffering servant who gives his life as a ransom for the many, and I will give him the many as his portion. The many become his inheritance. The inheritance of Messiah is his people. Now that's, that's very consistent with what we're seeing in book four right here. We move from a, the dominant figure of a king in books one, two, and three of the Psalms and a kingship to this idea that, first of all, of course, we know one of the major themes in book four is that the Lord is king. The Lord doesn't need a human king because he's king and it's gonna be the establishment of the Lord's kingship that will cause the kingdom to prosper. We also see this idea that's been called the democratization of the kingship in which the Lord moves from seeing the king as central to the establishment of his kingdom in the earth to his people as central to the establishment of his kingdom. And it's the people of God who take center stage in book four. It would be the people of God, Israel, who took center stage in the exile when there was no more king. And it's very interesting that this suffering servant whose life itself is an intercessory prayer begins to see that the inheritance of God is in his people. Now, the last intercessory prayer that I want to point out before we go back to uh, Psalm 90 and, and, and do this uh, summary of book four, is remember in John 17, the final act of Jesus before he goes to the cross is an intercessory prayer. Jesus then, following the model of Moses and David and Jeremiah and Daniel, following this, the, the, the example of all these great leaders who interceded for God's people, Jesus, following that tradition and with that mantle and that anointing, Jesus in John 17 makes intercession for God's people. The point we want to make here, and I believe this is the point of book four of the Psalter, and we can turn back to Psalm 90. The main point of book four is when the kingship is gone, when things appear to be going awry in God's kingdom, when we find times of confusion, times of perplexity, the plan isn't even going the way we thought God purposed the plan to go when God's people find themselves in exile, it is the time for intercessors to rise up and to enter into the spirit of Jesus's prayer of intercession in John 17 and pray like Moses for God's purposes to be established. So we're back at 
Psalm 90, and Psalm 90 is the answer to Psalm 89. Where the heck is the kingship, Lord? Where are your promises? Where is your steadfast love? I mean, steadfast love is mentioned so many times in Psalm 89. Um, By my count, eight times chesed, the steadfast love of the Lord is mentioned. And of course, if you're new to this teaching, uh, we'll, we'll cover that momentarily. Well, where is it? It's in the prayer of the intercessory leaders like Moses. So so Moses is introduced in book four. No kingship, no human kingship. It's gone. And it is Moses's prayer. And in the midst, and we've looked at this psalm, uh, in the midst of this prayer that emphasizes the futility of humanity, the inability of humanity to live up to God's standards, to set the bar high and to fulfill it and to walk in it, God raises up Moses as an intercessor. And we know the key verses begins in verse 13. Return, O Lord. Turn back to us, O Lord. How long will we continue in this exile? How long will we continue walking through the wilderness, Lord? How long, O Lord? Have pity on your servants. And we know that to have pity on your servants, we've been talking about it, it's the Hebrew word, nacham, and it means to, because of your compassion for your people, change your mind about your people and restore your people. We know that relates to Exodus 32, 33, and 34, where we see Moses's intercessorial ministry begin to be raised up when he came down from the mountain with the Lord and the people were worshiping the golden calf and the Lord said, I'm going to destroy this people, start over with you, Moses. And then Moses begins to intercede. Have pity on your people. Change your mind, O God. They're your people, Lord. They're your inheritance. See, Isaiah 53, the people are your inheritance, O Lord. The people are Messiah's inheritance. Lord, look at your people, not at political situations, not at ministry, not at how is this organization doing, how are these organizational goals being established. People, Lord, human beings, the work of your hand, you've created them, Lord. They're your inheritance. It's, it's funny, as we pointed out last week, the Lord says, well, your people did this and did that. And, Lord, and, and Moses says, no, they're your people, Lord. Well, they're your inheritance, O oh Lord. And he prays and he cries out for the Lord to deliver his people, to forgive his people, to raise them back up, to deliver them and to get them into the land, which was the original goal, so that they can worship you and serve you and become a center, a center for all the nations of the earth, a kingdom of priests, to minister unto the Lord so that all the nations of the earth can see who the Lord is. And Moses gets God to change his mind. 32, the Lord says, I'll forgive them. In 33, he forgives them, but the Lord's tent is outside the, the dwelling of the people, and Moses has to go out to this makeshift tent and, and confer with Yahweh, confer with the Lord. And so in Exodus 33, he continues his intercessory prayer. Now, now, Lord, you've forgiven him. That's good. You didn't destroy him. Praise God for that, Lord. But Lord, you need to dwell in their midst. If you don't dwell in their midst, how are they going to get to the land? How are it? How is it going to be known that they're your people? Yes, The Lord forgives God's people of their sins, but God needs to dwell in the midst of his people. Lord, show me your glory, Moses says. And what's his glory? It's the Lord's presence dwelling in the midst of his people. So Moses' intercession continues. Forgive them, dwell in their midst. And then finally, in Exodus 34, Lord, reveal yourself in your fullness to me and your people. You're going to forgive your people. 
You're going to dwell in the midst of your people, but we need to see who you really are. And see, that's what it means. Have pity on your servants. Change your mind. And just as the steadfast love in Psalm 89 that God promised to David appears to be lost, Moses continues to pray, change your mind about your servants because you have this compassion on them. And we're going to see, I mean, that, that theme runs through book four. This idea of the Lord's steadfast love, his chesed, his covenant loyalty and faithfulness to his people, and his tender mercies, his compassion towards his people. Have compassion on your servants, not just your people. They're your servants, or they're the ones whom you've raised up to serve your purposes in the earth. Satisfy us in the morning with your Chesed, your steadfast love. The steadfast love that seems like you removed when the kingship was destroyed, when the city was destroyed, when the temple was destroyed, when your people were brought into exile. Read right now. If this is an exile, I don't know what exile is. If, if what we're going through right now in our nation and in the world is not exile, I'm going to hate to see what exile is. But Moses prays, and we need to be praying right now for the church. Satisfy us in the morning. We're going through the night, Lord. We want to be in the morning. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us and for as many years as we've seen evil. So, Lord, whatever we have gone through this past year, whatever we're still going to go through, and if it gets worse before it gets better, fine, Lord, accomplish your purposes. You use exile to get your people to repent, to get your people in the reality, to get your people to turn back to your ways. Do what you have to do, Lord. One, one of the, the things that you often see is one of the most sobering times in 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 the life of a human being is, is at a funeral. When, when a loved one has passed away, people are sober. A lot of things that were important before the death of that loved one aren't important right now. And, and, and this is what God does. That's what it means that God brings us into exile to get us to repent. It's just to bring sobriety to us, to cause us to see what's really going on. So no. I don't want things to return to normal. Uh, when someone dies, it's, there's a new normal that takes place. You're not going to see that person no. again. Till, of course, bless God, for those of us who have the blessed hope of Christ, we, we, we are reunited with them once again when, when we cross the river from this life to the next. But, but that's... That's a normal that's not coming back ever. The normal that we want now is, Lord, communicate to us exactly what you want. And see, God has something to communicate to his people in exile. But the good news is, however bad it gets, make us glad for as many days as you've afflicted afflicted us, then it's going to be just that great and awesome. Orientation, disorientation leads to a new orientation. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us. Establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. We see the work of his hands that work that Psalm 104 gloriously lays out, we see the work of his hands. And by understanding that the Lord is king and he exercises his kingship in all these different dimensions in the earth, in our history, in our human experience, by seeing that and understanding that, then we can establish the work of our hands. See, our work becomes his work. It's Jesus in John chapter 5 saying, the son can do nothing of himself except what he sees the father doing. See, I look 
to see the Father establish the work of his hands. And then I, my work is based on the work of his hands. That's, that's, that's what Psalm 90 is talking. And then, then we understood Psalm 91. The Lord answers the prayer and says, I'll deliver you from your enemies. Psalm 92, which we said was a song for the Sabbath. Sabbath is sacred time. It means that God is control of, t- of time and that when the people of God intercede when we're in the wilderness, when leaders like Moses intercede, when we're in exile, God delivers his people by reminding us that he's in control of time. See, the Sabbath, what the Sabbath meant was one day a week, everything stopped to remind us that God is in control of time. God is in control of history. We're not in control of time and history. and We're not in control of, 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 of even those things that we work for six days for our own good and for the good of others. We stop, we submit to him, and we celebrate. The Sabbath was a celebration. And so when, when God's people really rise up to intercede, the Sabbath stops all human activity. And remember, a Sabbath year was when the activity, all activity stopped for a year, and the Jubilee year was when all activity stopped two years in a row. And here we are in this lockdown slash stoppage. I mean, it's sort of a 21st century version of the Sabbath year and the Jubilee year. It's we stop to celebrate God and we remember who's in control of time. So that's Psalm 90, 91, and 92. This is all birthed by intercessory prayer. Moses, we said, appears eight times in in the book of the Psalms and seven times in book four. We've already seen him in in, uh, 90. The next place we'll see him is in 99, but we've gone through Psalm 90, 91, 92. 93 through 100 deals with what 93, 1 says. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The world is established. It will never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. And the Psalms 93 through 100 all deal with the Lord reigning, the kingship of the Lord, the Lord establishing his throne. So when human leadership fails, and again, I'm, I'm, it's no mistake, we're talking about this when presidents have failed, when human leadership in both parties have failed, when, as we said last week, economic, scientific, social, psychological leaders have failed. We, we just, we're seeing this mass failing of leaders when leaders in churches have failed, when husbands have failed, when parents have failed, when we're in this time of just this massive spotlight on the failure of leadership, intercessors like Moses rise up, intercessors like Jeremiah rise up. David becomes not a king, but an intercessor. Intercessors like Daniel are raised up to establish the kingship of the Lord. All right, Lord, we get the point. Human leadership disqualified. Your leadership being established will never be disqualified. Reveal the work of your hands. Establish the work of your hands. Let your face, let your presence, let the revelation of who you are, let the revelation of your work through your son, Jesus Christ, be manifested now. Ah, the kingship of the Lord is established. Let the earth rejoice. And we know that Psalms 93 through 100 deal with the kingship of the Lord. The second place we see Moses in these Psalms is Psalm 99, verse 6. 99.1 99.1 again says, The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. 
97 says, verse 1, the Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice, let the many coastlands be glad. And there's an interesting phenomenon that takes place. In book 1, 2, and 3, it's about the Lord reigning in Israel. When there's no more king and God begins to establish his kingship, his kingship is not just in Israel. It now becomes extended to the entire world. See, the Lord's desire, this is a foreshadowing to the gospel. The gospel wasn't just for the Jewish people. It was for the Jewish people first because they were God's people. But it became a launching pad to spread the gospel to the entire earth. And that theme runs all through the Old Testament. The Old Testament is about Israel's relationship with Yahweh, their covenant God, a people of God being related to the true God of, the, of, 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 of all the earth, of the universe. But he is Yahweh to his people, but he's Elohim to all the nations of the earth. He's the Lord, this personal, special covenant God to Israel, but he's Elohim. He's the God of all the nations of the earth. So there's this, this idea that God is the Lord, the covenant God of Israel, but his purpose is to reveal himself to the entire earth. So we see in Psalm 93 through 100, remember that the Jews are removed from their land to foreign nations, nations plural. The Assyrians sent them to several nations. The Babylonians sent them to several nations. They are seeding the nations of the earth with the true Yahweh worshipers, true worshipers of the true God with the true message for all the nations of the earth. So we need to understand this. See, when God scatters his people, it's always to fulfill his purposes. He scatters them from Israel to seed the entire earth. Remember in the early chapters of Acts of the Apostles, they're having a party in Jerusalem, worshiping the Lord, praising the Lord. I mean, Jerusalem's being transformed. The Spirit of God is moving so powerfully. And the Lord sends a persecution to Jerusalem, and it drives the believers out into the other nations in the Roman Empire and beyond, and they go with the gospel. Whatever happens to America in this hour, God is going to seed the entire earth with his people and with his gospel. We need to trust the Lord. So so Moses is there in 99 verse 6. When we're talking about the Lord reigning, the Lord is still reigning by raising up good leaders. And they're leaders like Moses and Aaron. In 99 6, Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those who called on his name. They called to the Lord and he answered them. See, he brings Samuel in, which of course Samuel is right there. He's the one that anoints David as king. And basically, they, what do they do? What does Moses and Aaron and Samuel do? They intercede. So, so we're, we're, still, we're still talking about intercessory prayer. And then we get to Psalm 100 and it's the first an only psalm in the entire Psalter that is said, it's called a psalm for thanksgiving. When the Lord is established as king, and, and Psalm 100 through 106, and that'll, that'll be the, the final psalms we're going to look at here to kind of sum up this idea of the Lord's kingship that is established primarily through the intercession of godly leaders and the people of God. We're going to see what what the results of that kingship is. But it's a psalm for thanksgiving. And so we're moving from the confusion of Psalm 89, where, where are your promises, into intercessory prayer, which establishes a new song, the new thing things that the the Lord is doing in Psalm 96 and Psalm 98 begin with a new song, sing a new song unto the Lord. The Lord's doing a new thing and that new thing is moving us from our regret, our frailty, our struggles, our weaknesses, our inability to accomplish God's purpose, the failure of leadership 
and it's moving us toward thanksgiving. See, this, this is what intercessory prayer does. It establishes it. It, it, it. What I'm saying by, what I mean by intercessory prayer establishes a kingship. We pray to God. We pray to God. We pray to God. Establish your kingship. Lord, forgive your people their sin. Lord, show us your glory. Dwell in the midst of your people. Lord, reveal who you really are to us. And when God's kingship is established, we begin to move out of lament in the thanksgiving. We said that the dominant theme of the first three books of the Psalms, can you imagine the first 89 Psalms are primarily about lament, primarily about sorrow, primarily about discouragement. But the kingship of the Lord that is established in the midst of exile, in the midst of the wilderness, in the midst of great failure of leadership, including failure of God's leaders, and we'll see in these final psalms the failure of God's people, we move from lament to thanksgiving. See, that, that's, that's, this is our hope. Where we're at right now, oh, this is what's going to happen to our nation. Oh, that's what's going to happen to our nation. We need this president. No, we need that president. What we need is the kingship of the Lord to move us from lament to thanksgiving. So the psalm for thanksgiving, it's very simple. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. There, there, are, there are a number of verbs. Make a joyful noise to the Lord of all the earth. And this is the Lord of all the earth, not just the Lord of Israel. It's the Lord of all the earth. Not just the Lord of the church, but the Lord of the entire world earth, the cosmos. And what do we do? We make a joyful noise to the Lord. Verse two, we serve the Lord with gladness. That's a second verb. Verse, uh, the next part of verse two, we come into his presence with singing. That's the third activity. Then we know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us. We are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. It's this knowledge that his kingship, he will shepherd us in his kingship. Next, we enter, number five, we enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Next, we give thanks to him and we bless his name. So we make, we serve, we come into, we know, we enter, we give thanks, we bless his name. And then it says, for the Lord is good his steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. And thanksgiving leads us back to the same stark fact that is consistent under the old covenant and the new covenant. In the new covenant, it says, we beheld Jesus's glory. Gospel of John, chapter one. We beheld his glory. The glory of an only begotten son with a father full of grace and truth. He has a father, and that father bestows to him a glory that releases grace and truth. New covenant terms are grace and truth. The old covenant terms, which we've seen over and over and over in the Psalms, but are all throughout the Old Testament scriptures in this word pair. It's steadfast love and faithfulness. It's chesed and Emut. It's steadfast love and truth. Steadfast love and faithfulness. Faithfulness is reliability, truth. Grace and truth, New Testament, correspond to chesed and emit in the Old Testament. And so we recognize that God utilizes these gracious attributes, his faithfulness and his truth, his covenant loyalty and his faithfulness, his grace and his truth through Jesus Christ to establish his kingship, and that will bring us into thanksgiving. Now, the final six psalms then show us different aspects of the kingship of the Lord. When the kingship of the Lord is established, the kingship of the Lord is established in six different areas. Psalm 101, and notice who's back, a Psalm of David. David's back. 
Well, why is David back? Because David's not king. There, there's no king during the time of the exile, and there never will be a king of Israel until Jesus comes as the son of David and establishes God's kingdom apart from failure. Jesus succeeds in doing everything that God has called the righteous king to do. David comes in back at this point in a book in the Psalms, Psalms 90 through 106, dominated by Moses. David comes in to agree with Moses. David is brought in at this point to show that Moses and David agree. These two great leaders, these two, the two greatest leaders in the history of Israel. Five books of Moses, five books of the Psalms of David. David comes back in, and he'll come back another time. 101 is David, and 103 is David, and he'll come back to show that he's in agreement with Moses, that he and Moses are one, okay? The kingship and the, the prophetic ministry are one, as well as with the, the priestly ministry, they're one. And the kingship of the Lord is established in the moral realm. Now, God's leaders are to be intercessors and God's leaders are to live righteous lives. Righteous intercessors are the kind of leadership that the Lord wants to raise up in the body of Christ in this hour. Notice a Psalm of David, not as the king, but just coming back now as as a leader under the kingship of the Lord along with Moses. And notice where it starts. I will sing of, this, of steadfast love and justice. Steadfast love and, and faithfulness in uh, Psalm 100, verse 5 is the end of that psalm. This one is steadfast love and justice. Justice, remember, is when we open the doors for all people to have access to the blessings of the Lord. And justice is to remove obstacles to receiving the blessings of the kingship of the Lord that is being established. Leaders need to do that. We need to be dealing with sin. We need to remove obstacles for people to get blessed. See, the problem with sin is that sin hinders us from receiving the blessings of the Lord, okay? And the problem with sin is that sin, remember one of the three words for sin, and we're, we're going to see them in these, these, these next few um, psalms. The, the main Hebrew words for sin, one of them is refers to the devastation that sin brings to the lives of others. See, sin doesn't just hurt me. Sin has a ripple effect that hurts others. And it hurts others because it becomes an obstacle to God's justice being released. And God's justice is he wants people to be blessed. So David says, I'll sing of steadfast love and justice. To you, O Lord, I will make music. I will ponder the way that is blameless, the way of integrity. He's, he, the, the leader needs to be an intercessor who lives what he teaches, who lives what he prays. Who, and, and in fact, this is a real key to intercessory prayer. Lord, I, want, I pray for this, 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 and this to happen. And the Lord says, you become the answer. See, intercessors, righteous intercessors become the answer to the prayers they pray. If I'm praying for justice, God is going to make me a person of justice. If I'm praying for compassion, God is going to make me a person of compassion. If I'm going to pray for truth, God's going to make me a person of truth. If I'm going to be a, a pray for unity, God's going to make me a bridge builder. I will ponder the way that of integrity. When will you come to me? When will that integrity come to me? When will you come to me and make me that kind of intercessor? I will walk with the integrity of my heart within my house. Now, he walks within his house. That's his family. I will not set my eyes before anything that is idolatrous. Now, it's going gonna, it's gonna to catalog a lot of sins here. These are just dealing with just various violations of the Ten Commandments that, that need to be removed by an intercessor who sees God's kingship as 
being established in the moral realm. He deals with idolatry. I hate the work of those who fall away. Uh, uh, sin that causes people to stumble. That shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall be far from me. I will know nothing of evil. And that's the word evil that brings harm to others. I, I, I'll deal with uh, distortions of people's hearts. Whoever has a haughty look and an arrogant heart, I'll not endure. Pride and arrogance, they're, they're, they're hindrances uh, to the release of the Lord's blessing. Whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, he moves from actions bred in, in, in attitudes to words now, to, to sin in, the, in the, the realm of declaring falsehood. Whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. Now, the, the words that are used for destroying the Hebrew, destroy means to destroy by removal. We're going to remove these sins, these obstacles from the house, he says, starting with me. See, it always starts with you. Your, 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 your moral ministry doesn't start with you rebuking everybody else. It's got to start with your house, first of all. And when you deal with your house, then it will move beyond the house. He says, whoever has a haughty look and an arrogant heart, I will not endure. I will look with favor on the faithful. There's the ones, steadfast love and faithfulness. Those who have become immersed in God's steadfast love and faithfulness with the faithful in the land that they may dwell with me. He moves from the house to the land. The land now has to do with the place where the righteous intercessor lives. He who walks in the way of integrity shall minister to me. And, and people of integrity find other people of integrity. No one who practices deceit shall dwell in my house. Back to the house. No one who utter lies shall continue before my eyes. Morning by morning, I will destroy the wicked in the land. I will remove wickedness from the land. My house, my family, the land, the place where I dwell, and then cutting off all the evildoers from the city of the Lord, the people of God, the church, my house, my land, my city. So the Lord's kingship, when it's established, it rules in the moral realm. Psalm 102, a prayer of one afflicted, when he is faint and pours out his complaint before the Lord. The Lord exercises his kingship in the moral realm, and the Lord exercises his kingship in the realm of darkness and chaos that afflicts God's people, that afflicts human beings. So the kingship will manifest itself in a second realm. And this Psalm 102, it's a, it's a psalm of penitence. It's a, it's a psalm of repentance. It, it speaks of all the dark things that opposes human flourishing, that opposes human beings from walking in the blessings of the Lord. The first one had to do with the moral realm. This is the, the spiritual warfare realm, the realm of affliction. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me. Answer me speedily in the day when I call. The day of distress is the day of trouble, the day of chaos, the day where evil appears to be swallowing the people of God. The Lord's kingship will be exercised in that particular realm. Now notice, Psalm 100 is praise. Psalm 102 is prayer. Praise and prayer move us into the worship of the Lord. And that's where we're moving. We're moving from prayer and praise into this this fullness of thanksgiving, of blessing the Lord. And we will move through some, some difficult times. And Psalm 102, you read it, it enumerates difficulty after difficulty after difficulty. 
Verse three, my days pass away like smoke. My bones burn like a furnace. My heart is struck down like grass and has withered. I forget to eat my bread. Because of my loud groaning, my bones cling to my flesh. It's the, it's the realm of chaos and darkness and affliction of soul. But God's kingship is exercised there. And when God's kingship is exercised there, Verse 12 says, but you, O Lord, are enthroned forever. Yes, there's chaos, but your throne is being established in the midst of chaos. As intercessors, we pray for the throne of the Lord to be established in the midst of the chaos that we are now experiencing in our lives. And we will again remember the Lord. You are remembered through all generations. We're praying for the elderly. We're praying for middle age. We're praying for the young we're praying for the children of the young. We're praying for newborn babies. The Lord will be remembered through all generations. You will arise and have pity on Zion. You're going to restore us from exile. It is the time to favor her. The appointed time has come. Remember back in Psalm 92, the Lord is in charge of time. For your servants, we're going to see, we see this theme of God establishing the work of the hands of his servants through intercessory prayer. Lord, we want to see, we're praying for your work to be established, and when your work is established, you will restore our work. And what is their work? Your servants hold her stones dear and have pity on her dust. We're rebuilding the house of the Lord after exile. Nations will fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth will fear your glory. For the Lord builds up Zion, he appears in his glory. He regards the prayer of the destitute and does not despise their prayer. And verse 28, the psalm closes, the children of your servants shall dwell securely. Their offspring shall be established before you. So when the kingship of the Lord is established in Psalm 100, Psalm 93 through 100, through the intercessory prayer of Psalms 90 through 92, through Moses' work, as an intercessor, the Lord establishes his kingship in the moral realm. We become people of righteousness and integrity. He establishes his kingship in the realm of chaos. Psalm 103, David again. And now what's going to be interesting is David not only agrees with Moses, the, the primary theme of Psalm 103 is Exodus 34, where the Lord appears he appears before Moses. Just keep your finger in uh, Psalm 103 because I, I want to get through these last few verses quickly. And go back to Exodus 34. I want to remind you of this. In Exodus 32, the Lord forgives his people their sin. In Exodus 33, he promises to send his glory and dwell in their midst. And in Exodus 34, he promises to reveal himself in his fullness. And this is what he does. He tells Moses to go up to the mountain and stand in the rock. I'm going to put you in the rock. We see who God really is through the rock, through Jesus. Jesus is our rock. The rock that followed them in the wilderness was the Lord, was the Messiah, was Jesus, Paul says in the New Testament. But the Lord says, stand in a rock and I'm going to go before you and I'm going to proclaim my glory to you. I'm going to proclaim the name of the Lord and the name of the Lord is who the Lord really is. And this is what he says in Exodus 34, 6. The Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh, the Lord, the Lord, a merciful God, a God who's gracious, who's slow to anger, abounding in chesed and emmit abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands and these thousands and thousands of generations that are constantly being referred to in Psalms 90 through 106, it's the prayer of Moses who saw Exodus 34. Keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. Forgiveness is there. But, who will by no means clear the guilty. Now, up to this point, we have the compassionate, forgiving God, but we also have the God of justice. 
we have to understand forgiveness isn't that God just overlooks anything and everything anybody does and people can do anything they want and God will forgive them. God forgives, but he forgives so that we rise up and become like him. There's still a justice to God. People who do not trust him, believe in him, obey him, submit to him, there's another dimension. He's the compassionate God, but he's also the God who deals with justice. So it is a just and righteous forgiveness. It is a forgiveness that does not overlook the fact that injustice on the part of human beings, sin on the part of human beings, can hinder other people and become obstacles for them to receive the blessings of the Lord. Now, the the Lord wants to see all blessed, but those who hinder God's blessing, well, here's the second part of who he is, who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquities of the fathers on the children and the children's children, to a third and fourth generation. Now Moses takes advantage of this compassionate but just God. He bows his head toward the earth. He worships. And he said, if now I have found favor in your sight. See, he, every, at every point of the revelation of the Lord, there's the intercession of Moses. Forgive them of their sins in 32. Dwell in their midst in 33. And oh, in in, in 34, now that you're revealing who you are, yes, you are the both the compassionate but just God. He says, if I found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us. For it is a stiff-necked people and pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for your inheritance. The third aspect is, yes, yes, we, we, we know you're going to deal with unrighteousness and injustice. But Lord, take us as your inheritance. Remember, Lord, take us as your inheritance, which means you're going to transform us to be everything you desire us to be. Forgive us. Let your presence dwell in our midst. But when we see who you really are, you're the God that wants to suspend the laws of cause and effect and start our lives over again so that we can walk in the fullness of of your righteousness. We can become chesed people. We can become amit people, people of your steadfast love and faithfulness. Pardon our iniquity and sin. Take us as your inheritance. Now back to Psalm 103. Now, as Pastor Jan has pointed out, Psalm 103, we're moving from thanksgiving and prayer to blessing the Lord. Psalm 103 says, bless the Lord, O my soul, All that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, Exodus 34. Who heals all your diseases, earlier in Exodus. Who redeems your life from the pit. Who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Now, what Psalm 103 is, it's a reworking of Exodus 34. But here's who's it by. It's by David. And David is saying, wait a second. There's a Davidic covenant and a Mosaic covenant. The Mosaic covenant appears to be a covenant of cause and effect. A conditional covenant. You obey, you're blessed. You disobey, you're cursed. The covenant to Abraham and the covenant to David, one before the covenant of Moses, one after the covenant of Moses, chronologically, are unconditional covenants. But David is saying, wait, I'm I'm standing here as a member of an unconditional covenant with Abraham. We'll see Abraham in Psalm 105. We're going to stand here and say, actually, Lord, even though the Mosaic Covenant was a conditional covenant. Remember when you talked about your steadfast love and your faithfulness and your forgiveness, and then you added that justice stuff there about you pardon, but you're not going to pardon just arbitrarily. Well, wait a second. Can you bring the Mosaic Covenant in, in, in line with Abraham's covenant and David's covenant and kind of like rework that? Watch. Watch what David does. He crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. He satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. 
The eagle sheds his feathers every year and gets a whole new set of feathers for the next year to fly. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. That's what he talked about in the previous psalm. He made known his ways to Moses. Moses said, show me your ways, Lord. Let me see who you really are, Lord. But he also revealed his actions, his deeds to the people of Israel. He showed who he was to Moses and he showed what he was going to do to deliver his people to the people. Do that again, Lord. Show us who you are and then demonstrate who you are by your works. The Lord is merciful and gracious. Here's Exodus 34. Slow in anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. Wait, wait a second. Where, where, where's, the, where's the punishing God? We have the God uh, of mercy. We have the, the God of justice who, who punishes when he needs to. Well, where is it? It's being reworked in the tradition here in the Psalms. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great again is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. Give us your fear, Lord. How do we get your fear? By seeing you for who you really are. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. He removes cause and effect. He removes our transgressions from us and he starts our lives over again fresh with his steadfast love and his faithfulness. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. He knows our frame. He remembers we are but dust. Verse 17, the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. Intercessors, this is what we pray. This is what I pray for people all the time. Lord, put the fear of the Lord on that person. Bring them into repentance, Lord. Let them be your inheritance, Father, in the name of Jesus. And his righteousness to his children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. When the kingship of the Lord is established, the Lord reveals himself, who he really is. Exodus 34, and he reveals himself primarily as the God of steadfast love and faithfulness and not the God who visits the sins of the fathers on the sins of their children. God and remember, David is praying this now. He's praying Moses' prayer because what did God do to David? He visited David's sin on David's children. Absalom and Adonijah and, 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 and the son that, that, that raped his, his sister Tamar. David is saying, I have the unconditional covenant and Moses who had the conditional covenant saw a Lord who transcends all the covenants, who wants to transform his people. Intercessors pray. Don't give up on anyone. Pray for God to baptize people in his steadfast love and in his faithfulness. This is why we can finish Psalm 103 with bless the Lord. Verse 20, bless the Lord, verse 21. Bless the Lord, verse 22, all his works. We want to see the works of his hands established. And that's the works that Moses prayed in 34. Lord, they're a stiff-necked people, but make them your inheritance. And to make them your inheritance is to make them into those people of integrity of Psalm 101. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Pastor Jan's already done Psalm 104. It, it, it shows his kingship being manifested in all of the creation, not just the human creation, all of the creation. The heavens, the earth, the mountains, the waters, the beasts of the earth, the climate, everything. The Lord manifests his authority, his kingship. If he manifests it in the entire cosmos, how much more with human beings in their history? And it starts with, bless the Lord, O my soul, O oh Lord, my God, you are very great. And Psalm 104 ends with the words, Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord. Let the sinners be consumed from the earth. Let the wicked be no more. Remove all the obstacles, Lord, to blessings. To blessings, Lord. 
and we get to 105 and 106, and we close. 105, he exercises his lordship. He exercises his lordship in the realm of covenant. He exercises his lordship in the moral realm, 101, in the realm of darkness and the things that afflict human beings in 102. He exercises his kingship in revealing who he really is, who he really is, that mercy triumphs over judgment, book of James. Psalm 104, he exercises his kingship in the entire created world. And and in Psalm 105, he exercises his kingship in covenant. Now, Psalm 105 is all, we we don't have time to read it all. Read it, it'll be tomorrow's Psalm. 106 will be Tuesday's Psalm. 105 is all positive because we're dealing, it deals with the history of God's people and it shows over and over and over again how God rises up to be faithful to his covenant. Psalm 106 is predominantly negative. Psalm 106, the Lord exercises his kingship in the midst of God's people's sin and rebellion. Almost there, brother. Almost there. Nothing stops the kingship of the Lord from coming forth. Psalm 105, oh, give thanks to the Lord. Now we've gone from blessing the Lord and we've ended Psalm 104 with praise the Lord and now we're gonna give thanks to the Lord. Psalm 100, a psalm of thanksgiving. When the kingship of the Lord is established, worship and thanksgiving burst forth. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make his deeds among the people known. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works he's done. Establish the works of your hand. And when his kingship is established, this is what it looks like. He establishes it in the moral realm. He stops chaos. He reveals who he is. He controls all of creation And now he's going to exercise his kingship in the covenant realm. And the covenant is the agreement that he has come into with his people. Abraham, Moses, David. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done. His works again. His miracles and the judgments he uttered. O offspring of Abraham. Now we're going to get everybody. And we've got David. We've got Moses. We've got Samuel. We've got Aaron. Now we're going to get everybody in. O offspring of Abraham, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. There's this emphasis that God's people have been chosen by him. Jesus said it in John 10, you did not choose me, I chose you. And I ordained that you would go forth and bear much fruit. And Psalm 105 says, God's people bear fruit because he's faithful. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant. Covenant is a legally binding agreement that God makes with men. The difference between the covenant to Abraham and David, it's, a, it's unconditional because it's, it's all about the only binding legal agreements are upon God. I'm going to do this for you, David. I'm going to do this for you, Abraham. In Moses' covenant, it's conditional because I'll do this if you do that. But what we're seeing here in book four is who the Lord is transcends. There's a kind of an adjustment of the of the tradition in Psalm 103 that says it is his steadfast love and his faithfulness that are going to prevail in this. He remembers his covenant forever. The word that he commanded for a thousand generations. Psalm 105, 8. Verse 9, the covenant he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute. He made it legal. The written word makes it legal. That's why the scriptures are so important. It's a legal document. Saying, thus says the Lord, the Lord showed me this. That's an oral document. 
And if you've ever watched Judge Judy, give it to me in writing. Oh, well, it was an oral promise. Well, I don't know what we can do about that. We need prophetic words, but they are oral promises and they do not have the binding legality that the written word has. Which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying to you, I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. And then it, it begins to relate the entire history the entire history of Israel. We talk about, there's talk about Joseph, there's talk about Jacob, there's talk about the time in Egypt. Uh, Moses and Aaron are, are brought up again in verse 26. He sent Moses, his servant, and Aaron, whom he had chosen. They performed his signs among his people, miracles in the land of Egypt. All of this, and it shows time and time again, there's nothing negative in Psalm 105. It's completely positive. Nothing negative. The Lord establishes his kingship and it's his authority in his covenant. And it ends with, it ends with in verse 43. Well, verse uh, 42, as they're going through Egypt and coming into the land, the Lord remembered his holy promise and Abraham his servant. Notice, Abraham his servant. This, this, the servants, establish the work of your servants' hands. See, these are godly leaders who create servants among God's people. He remembered his holy promise and Abraham his servant. He brought his people out with joy, his chosen, one with, chosen ones with singing. His people are chosen, his leaders are chosen. They're chosen and he gave them the lands of the nations and they took possession of the fruit of the people's toil that they might keep his statutes and observe his laws. And again, it ends with praise the Lord. So we move from bless the Lord to praise the Lord. And Psalm 106 begins with praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Verse seven, our fathers, when they were in Egypt, did not consider your wondrous works. They did not remember the abundance of your steadfast love but rebelled by the sea, yet you save them for your name's sake. See, when we forget the steadfast love of the Lord, we go into sin. Psalm 106, where Psalm 105, is, it's completely positive. The Lord exercises his kingship among his people to accomplish his purposes. Psalm 106 is going to be negative. It's negative. It's, it's going to just talk about all the sin of God's people, how God's people sinned but we're gonna have our final references to Moses and we're gonna close with this. In the midst of forgetting the steadfast love of the Lord, we see sin. Verse 16, when men in the camp were jealous of Moses and Aaron, the Holy One of the Lord, the earth opened and swallowed up Dathan and covered the company of Abiram. Fire also broke out in the company. Flame burned up the wicked. They made a calf in Horeb and worshiped a metal image. They exchanged the glory of God. Verse 21, they forgot God their savior. They forgot his wondrous deeds. The Lord said he would destroy them. Now in the midst of all of this sin, it, book four ends with sin, but it's not really ending with sin. It's ending with Moses the intercessor. Remember how Psalm, 10, uh, Psalm 90 began, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. And Moses interceded and got God to change his mind. Daniel interceded, got God to change his mind. Jesus interceded. He made his whole life an intercession and got God to change his mind. Even though 106 closes with all the sins of God's people, it says the final manifestation of God's kingship is that he exercises his kingly authority even in the midst of the sin of his people. And, and, and what are we to do? Because if, if we're going to look at book four and say, where are we? We're in exile. We're in the wilderness and we see the sin of God's people being manifested. If God is going to exercise his kingly authority in the midst of God's people's sin, how will he do that? Verse 23, therefore the Lord said he would destroy them had not Moses his chosen one, stood in the breach before him 
to turn away his wrath from destroying them. So we start with Moses who prays for God to change his mind. Exodus 32, 33, 34. How are we praying? God, forgive your people their sin. God, let your glory dwell in the midst of your people. And God, reveal who you really are to your people. There is, there is one last warning here, and it's to all intercessors. Finally, the Lord says in verse 32, of Psalm 106, that they angered the Lord at the waters of Meribah. See, they continue, even when God would show them mercy, forgive them, they just continued to show the opposite of thanksgiving, the opposite of prayer, the opposite of faith, the opposite of receiving his steadfast love and faithfulness. And when they finally angered, and this is the book of Numbers, they finally angered the Lord. And this was, it was at this point that the Lord said, the first generation is not going in to take the land. The second generation was. Remember all you old folks, you're the first generation and you need to not do what Moses did when you're interceding for the people of God. They angered the Lord at the waters of Meribah and it went ill with Moses on their account, for they made his spirit bitter, and he spoke rashly with his lips. Moses got angry. Moses taught, the people didn't listen. Moses prophesied, the people didn't respond. Moses was in the presence of God and communicated what the Lord would have for them. The people didn't trust the Lord. Moses got manna from heaven. Moses got water from the rock. Moses' prayers were constantly being answered. The people were being blessed and forgiven. The people still resisted, and Moses got angry. So, so here's what the, what the three times for prayer tell us, and we're going to close here, intercessors. The, the superscription of Psalm 90 The verse here in verse 23 of Psalm 106 where Moses got God to change his mind and the final reference to Moses where Moses got angry and then God judged Moses. The first communication of Moses' prayer says to leaders, pray for the people. Intercessors, pray for the people. The second to last, 106.23 says, intercede to get God to change his mind. And the last reference, verse 32 here says, do not get angry at God or his people or you will not enter the land. Numbers 20, 10 through 13. So Father, we close and we ask you in the name of Jesus, we need intercessors in this hour. Your kingship is gonna be established and you're gonna move powerfully. You're gonna move us from lament into prayer, into praise, into thanksgiving, into blessing the Lord, into worship, Lord. You're going to do that with us, Lord. You're going to do that. Lord, Psalm 106 and book four closes with these words. Verse 48, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting, and let all the people say amen, praise the Lord. So, Father, this is what we conclude. Blessed be your name, and may all the people say amen, and may we all join together and praise the Lord as we get through this difficult time and we see the kingship of the Lord established even in the midst of human failure. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. God bless you. Go in peace, brethren. Serve the Lord.